Hi, I'm here to talk to you about the fundamental techniques on the clarinet of how to really handle the register change on the instrument. More than one register change. We'll handle, we'll work on both of them. And I'll use the Arkansas all region music for both junior high school and senior high school this year because it applies to all of us. I'm I'm, I'm, I'm not really surprised because it's a challenge, but you know, every time I work with students of beginning level all the way through high school, and then even when they come to college, handling the register change is something that all of us need to pay extra attention to. And it's the kind of thing that professional clarinetists spend a lot of their time dealing with it. Um, we have whole books about <laughs> certain parts of this. So I think that uh, first off, we need to talk about what exactly do I mean by the register change on the clarinet? Well, we've got several things. Um, on the clarinet, we've got what we might refer to as the fundamental register, which covers the very lowest part of the clarinet all the way up until we get to these very short notes on the instrument. Technically, it's all the way up here to B flat, where we have the A lever, and the register key pressed at the same time. That's technically the fundamental register of the instrument. Um, this little area up here, G, G sharp, A, and B flat, it's sort of like a subset. We call that the throat register, but it's still part of the fundamental register. When we add the register key at the back of the instrument, that takes us to the next register, which is called the clarion register. And from that point, going higher into the next register, what we call the altissimo register, that's basically everything above a high C, which is thumb and register key. There's your high C. To go beyond that, we have to put fingers back down on the instrument, but we open the first, uh, the, the left index finger tone hole on the upper joint of the clarinet, and that helps us go up into the altissimo register. So we have three distinct registers that we work with all the time on the clarinet. Now, right to begin with, we're going to be really concerning ourselves with the register change from the fundamental register or the Chalamo up to the clarion register. And that's where I really feel like it's one of the most important things for all young clarinet players to learn how to deal with in order to successfully make the transition from junior high school to high school. Um, I think that that is something that, if, if you're a teacher out there, that's something that will really make a difference for your students and whether they feel successful playing the clarinet and making that transition from junior high to high school. So not all register changes are created equal. Some things are a lot easier than others. And for the students out there, you may be able to tell me right away um, what that is, you know. The f easiest one that most of us can do, even within the first, uh, you know, if we're, if we're doing things correctly with different parts of our fundamental technique, which we'll get into, you can probably play a register change within several months of playing the instrument. All you have to do is, from a fundamental note on the instrument, let's pick um, low B flat, all you have to do is press the register key. Going up from B flat, it takes us up to F in the upper register, which is the interval of a 12th. That works really well for just about everybody. Just adding that little register key right there, most of us can do that. And a lot of times we'll even as teachers will help our students do that where you the student can just play that low note and we can reach around and press that register key for you when you don't even expect that we're going to do it and you're often very surprised that it works quite well. So that's really one of the easiest register changes that we do to begin with. Um, then kind of like working through levels of difficulty the next step that really works for people is going down from the upper register to the fundamental register, playing very small intervals. So we might play something like, we might play a low F, add the register key, go down one key, 
and then go down to our throat register A. <laughs> Going down doesn't work too badly. As we go on with levels of difficulty, we get to the most challenging part where we end up having to play, let's say, from A up to B natural. That is a really large hurdle that we have to overcome. So let's talk about the things that we need to do and work on in order to be able to successfully handle that most difficult part of register changing there. So what things need to be in place? Before we get to any kind of register changing, think about the things that your teachers are having you work on for the younger students here. Um, you're spending a lot of time with how you use your air. Of course, that's so crucial for all of us. So it's really learning how to manage your air in a very steady and consistent way. Another thing we spend a lot of time on is embouchure development, like what are we going to do with our mouth? How do we interact with the mouthpiece and the reed in order to get a characteristic sound on the clarinet? So we're learning how to have a very consistent embouchure. We're having to learn what I refer to uh, um, as voicing. We're having to learn what goes on inside our mouth with our tongue in order to help get a characteristic sound on the clarinet. So we've got, so far we've got our air, we've got our embouchure and our voicing. And then the last big challenge is really right here. The left index finger for us on the clarinet is enormously important on what we do here. So I've got a few exercises we'll do about that. Let's work our way through, um, starting from the inside, starting with air. So I think what causes a lot of problems for us on the clarinet is the fact that we are constantly getting different resistance feedback from the instrument depending on what part of the clarinet we're playing. So think about what a, a nice really easy responsive note is to play and you probably go okay well that's a something clear up here in the short part of the horn let's say open G you know that's that's a really not a very resistant note and so it's easy for us to blow but then you've noticed as you start adding fingers to the clarinet and making it longer it becomes much more resistant so we have to learn how to make our air work in a consistent way so that we're always getting the reed to really vibrate quite a lot. We have to be able to play dynamic changes, so we might even need to play louder, but you're getting different feedback from the clarinet, depending on what part of the instrument you play on. So we have to learn how to separate that, where, okay, I'm the clarinet's telling me one thing, but we have to train our brain and our body to say, okay, well, that doesn't matter. I'm still going to do this with my air. So one way that I try to do that as a clarinetist or as a wind player is that I'm trying to find a way to manipulate my diaphragm muscle a little bit. And we can all do this and figure out what this feels like. If you take a big breath and you say, shh, okay, you've got to pretend that there's that kid across the library who's making a big racket and you're supposed to be studying right now because you're all really conscientious students, right? Um, so right now, go ahead and take a big breath and give me a big shh, all right? Ready? Okay, now, you're gonna do this again. This time, I want you to poke yourself in your stomach, so kind of right around your belly button, and get, your, get an index finger, poke in yourself there, poke in a little bit. I want you to take a big breath and shh one more time. And we're gonna talk about what we feel after that. Ready? Okay, now, unless you're very unusual, probably what you experienced was that you took your breath and you felt your stomach muscles pushing your finger out a little bit and then when you gave me the shh, what happened is your stomach and waist area was doing something like this. It was pushing outward and downward. And it probably stayed that way for a little ways into your shh until the very end when you were running out of air. And then maybe you felt the, the st your stomach area come inward a little bit. So what's happening there is you are, by, by engaging those muscles in that way, 
what I jokingly refer to as your shh muscles, is that you are trying to slow the return of the diaphragm muscle to its natural resting position. So we hear that a lot about breathe from your diaphragm, use your diaphragm. Now it is an involuntary muscle, so you can't entirely control that muscle, but think about what it does to keep you alive. That muscle, it's kind of like a little trampoline under your lungs, let's say, and it's attached at the front of your rib cage and then to where your ribs come around towards the back, it's attached back there. So it's this little trampoline thing and it goes down, it goes back up. Right now, just sitting at rest, your diaphragm is doing something like this on its own. You are not controlling it. Now, when we take a breath and go, shh, you are keeping the diaphragm down there and you are keeping it from as quickly returning to its upward natural resting position. And that is a way that you can control your airflow to be nice and steady moving at the reed. And the funny thing about this is, yes, I know that we have to blow air because we have to use our air in a way that we, our body does not do in its natural resting state. So we do have to do something and it, it does feel like blowing, but the longer I've played and the more I've checked in with that approach, I don't really feel like I'm blowing when I play my clarinet or my saxophone. I feel like I am just managing my airstream. So that's something that we want to work on. We can play a little exercise and experiment with that and you can see if that's something that you think you're already doing and you just didn't realize it and now I've described it to you. Or if it's not something you've been doing, you can try to do it. And we're going to play a register change. We're going to play two register change changes, some of the more easy ones to do. We're going to start down here at a low G in the fundamental register. We're going to add our register key to go up a 12th to D. And then we're going to stepwise go down, kind of like we're playing a G major scale. We're going to go from D to C to B, A, and G. Now, what I want you to think about, I want you to think about using your shh muscles. So there's that outward, downward kind of muscular activity the whole time. And the second thing, try to crescendo a little bit. See if you can crescendo through the register change from B to A. And we'll talk about that in a second. So you can play with me, you can pause me anytime you want and try some things and then turn it back on again, but I'm going to play it here. <laughs> idea about crescendoing through the register change from B to A, for the younger students that can feel kind of weird because B is a really long note on the instrument. It's much more resistant. So that doesn't feel weird to feel like you need to blow a lot of air for that. But when you go from B to A, A is automatically, you've changed the length of this instrument from here all the way back to here. So there's a huge resistance change. So to you, the feedback you're getting when you go to A is that A is this out of control, obnoxious note, okay? And that is very uncomfortable for young clarinet players. And we have to figure out how to um, say no to that impulse we get from our brain like, ah, back off, because that A feels so strange. Eventually we start learning that if we can keep our air nice and steady using our shh muscles, we accept the fact that A feels a little bit big when we get there, that's okay. We have to understand that we're actually hearing air bouncing off the pads up here and it sounds a little bit buzzy and a little bit weird and we think, oh, that doesn't sound good, but really it's not so bad. And so a little game you can play with, uh, with your friends in the clarinet section to realize this is if you play in this way and you the player feel like you're going from B to A to G and those short notes are really obnoxious, up close it might sound one way, but if your friend goes across the room or you go across the room or your family member at home is down the hall, they you want to find out what they're hearing. And I can almost guarantee that they are going to say, uh, oh, 
it just I, I didn't realize you changed registers. It's the same volume, it's the same tone quality, but up close it feels like there's a change. So as a clarinetist, we just have to learn how to accept some of that and we get used to it and eventually you don't even notice it anymore. It's just the way that you play clarinet. Okay, the next fundamental thing we need to talk about with changing registers is some things related to our embouchure. And as I mentioned about the feedback we get from the clarinet affecting our air sometimes, it also can affect our embouchure. Our embouchure, it's like hitting a speed bump when you're driving a car, riding your bike or something. You get this change and it causes this turbulence sometimes and it makes our embouchure want to wiggle a little bit. And so let's just talk about a, just a few quick basics about embouchure. This is not an embouchure video, so we're not going to spend too much time. But, you know, little things, little basic things that we all have to do. You know, we open our mouth just a little bit. We cover the cutting edge of our bottom teeth with our bottom lip. So it's not too much lip. We don't want to pull it all the way over. So just a little bit, cover the cutting edge. Okay, top lip, think top lip is going to go down to the mouthpiece and into the teeth. So we're firming our top lip against our top teeth. Our corners are going to come in. I try to engage with the sides of my mouthpiece quite a bit. Okay, and then of course, clarinet face, we've got the chin point, right? So we've got the natural indentation right here, okay? So we make that clarinet face and slide it up and in. So right there, see if you can find that top lip muscle, top lip engagement down to the mouthpiece into the teeth. Now, when we're playing the instrument, we have to mentally do some things to maintain good embouchure control, good muscular control, especially when we're changing registers because of that resistance feedback we get. So sometimes just giving yourself a simple instruction. We don't want to think about all those little parts that we just talked about. We might want to think about one little positive idea. One of my all-time favorites that I read once that I use over and over again, and it works for me, it works for my students all the time, is feel like you're pulling your teeth back into your mouth. All right? If you make your clarinet face and you've got all that firmness around here and you feel like you're pulling your teeth into your mouth, that really firms up and engages those muscles in a productive way. So let's play the same exercise that we did a moment ago. G, up to D, down the scale steps to open G, but this time I want to go back up again, okay? And so the whole time you're going to be really focusing on feel like you're pulling your teeth back into your mouth and see if you can feel any little wobble that wants to happen from your embouchure when you go down in the register change or when you come back up. And of course, if you can engage your sh muscles, that will be helpful too. So same exercise, but we're going back up this time. Okay, here I go. Now, there could have been a variety of other problems that could have happened because we're still not done with some of our fundamentals about register changing. But I would like to think that your air did what it needed to do and it ignored the difference of resistance that you got from register change. I would also like to think that your embouchure was able to stay very steady and if it wasn't you could kind of feel for the first time you realized oh this is happening my embouchure is wobbling generally what happens is it gets looser okay as a clarinet player I think I'm always having to think about being firm into the mouthpiece. Um, and it's all muscular work, by the way. It's not the jaw, right? Your teachers have told you, don't bite the reed. You know, because when you think about what the jaw is supposed to do, it's supposed to crush stuff. So, you know, it's not made to play a clarinet. And this thin reed is extremely crushable. So we just have to be careful with that. So it's all about the muscular work. But I think that something positive and productive, like feeling like you're pulling your teeth back into your mouth, allows you to engage your muscles in a consistent way, stay really active with the mouthpiece, and not overdo it. You're not, hopefully, crushing the reed. Okay, 
The third thing on our list that we're going to address right now is the issue of voicing or what happens inside your mouth with your tongue while you were playing the clarinet. And I'm not talking anything at all about articulation. This has nothing to do with articulation right now, but of course it will help with articulation when we're dealing with that. So a lot of us have learned by now that the tongue position in the mouth for a characteristic clarinet sound is very high and forward. So if you say different vowels, you can feel your tongue changing position. The clarinet tongue position we need is very much E, lots of E, and you can feel E is quite high in your mouth. And if you said different vowels and went through them, you know, like A, E, I, O, U, or U, you know, you feel your tongue change around. Really, the most successful clarinet one we've got is E. And sometimes we, you know, we're going to modify it a little bit here and there depending on what we're doing. But in general, we want to go with the E vowel. And, you know, this is why a lot of beginning clarinet teaching we play on just the mouthpiece and the barrel. And so if we play just the mouthpiece and barrel and do the right things with our embouchure and our voicing, we're able to get, there's a specific pitch we get, which is concert F sharp, and if we can match that pitch, here, I'm gonna play, I'm gonna play, play F sharp, concert, well, I'm gonna play concert F sharp on clarinet. Now I'm gonna test that and make sure, I'm gonna do all the things that I think I'm supposed to do, and hopefully I match that pitch. Yeah, so it's working out for me right now. Um, concert F sharp on clarinet, it's G sharp, all right? So even if you are watching this video and you don't have access to a keyboard or a tuning device that can play you different pitches, um, you could play a G sharp and use that as your pitch. I play G sharp in the upper register, that's the best match for this, but you could even play G sharp right here and verify that you're getting the right pitch. Okay, so if you didn't get the correct pitch, it could be that your embouchure is not firm enough into the mouthpiece. It could be that you actually do need a teeny bit more pressure on the reed. And very likely it could be that your tongue is not high enough. So you have to find that E place. And little things that we do about that that can help us, you know, sometimes you might even want to find your upper molars with the sides of your tongue. So if you say key, K-E-Y, key, the K brings your tongue up in the middle middle of your tongue and you can feel you come up and you contact your upper molars it kind of does this to make that K sound so key is a really nice reference point sometimes okay now what we're going to do here is we're going to play the beginning of the Arkansas one of the Arkansas junior high all region pieces and instead of going down through the register change, we're gonna go up this time because we're upping the challenges as we go here. And we're really working on the tongue staying up and forward, and that is really going to help the ascending register change here. So um, the other little part I wanna, of course I wanna remind you about, we keep, we're always referencing back to what we've done. So we're gonna make sure we're using our shh muscles the whole time to deliver that nice intense air stream at the reed. We're going to make sure that we're trying to stay firm and engaged with our embouchure muscles into the mouthpiece. And then this time we're seeing if we can keep our tongue really up and forward the whole time as we are playing this register change. Here we go. So that time we did one of the most challenging register changes, which was going from A up to B. Now, there are a few other little things along the way that we could talk about. Maybe your teachers have talked to you about pre-fingering, where you get your right hand down on the tone holes ahead of time. So in this particular excerpt, I would just start with my right hand in position. I would start with one, two, three, and my low F key in place so that it's ready to go when I 
when I'm playing from A to B, so that all I have to do is manipulate my left hand fingers, okay? So that's one thing that can help. So you might want to practice it just a little bit. You might want even, even want to practice going up and immediately back down. And the whole time, keep your right hand in position. That could be something to do. Ideally, having your tongue a little more up and forward the whole time was helpful, and maybe you got a little bit better regis register change happening. If you didn't, we're going to go on to the final piece of the puzzle, which is left index finger, okay? So, think about, first off, that how your left hand has to uh, engage with the clarinet right here. Little things that are really helpful for us. Sometimes we talk about a, making a C shape with our fingers and bringing that to the clarinet. I kind of find with the left hand, it starts as a C, but then it collapses just a little bit. So it's a little more, I don't know, kind of U-like. And the reason that that's really helpful is we want to try to cradle this G sharp key right here. We want to stay in contact with that. So looking at it from the front, it's kind of weird. And when you first start playing clarinet, this maybe felt odd to you, but it's like your fingers come up and wrap around and then your left index finger needs to angle down slightly. Get this right here in front of the, right in front of the camera where it's coming up and angling down, okay? We're not coming in perpendicular to the horn like you might think that we are to begin with. It's really this wrapping around quality, okay? That's the first thing. Now, where I really pay a lot of attention is everything that I do with my left index finger, I want to keep my fingernail in line with the A lever. So I mean in line from top to bottom, going this way. I want to keep that in line. Now, if I'm playing something and my fingernail starts working that way, <laughs> of course it won't go that far, but you know what I mean. If I start finding my finger moving that way too much, I'm losing control of my hand. I'm losing control of getting to and from the A key. I'm losing control of being able to seal that tone hole really consistently. So let's do something to work on that right now. What you're going to do is you're going to play E, thumb and one E, and you're going to, without letting go of the E, you're going to kind of rock up here with your finger and press very low on the A lever. Make that A lever open without letting go of the E. And it sounds bad, okay? Totally sounds bad. know what that interval is it's a weird one um, go ahead and try it so if you, you can pa pause me for a second and play that interval and anybody in your household will think you lost it <laughs> but just give that a try and look in look in the mirror or put your phone on music stand and turn on the camera and flip it around so you could just watch you don't even have to record yourself um, just watch what that looks like and see like yeah I can get to that a lever pretty low without letting go of the tone hole Okay, now, after you've done that, you realize how little you can move that finger, and you're trying to use the side of your index finger, just above the fingernail there. You're trying to use that to press very low on the A lever. Now we're going to raise the level here, and we're going to play the actual interval. So you will let go of E this time, so of course you will open at the back you will release the tone hole here. You've got to let that ring go all the way up. Now, while you're doing that, you might even kind of look down the horn a little bit, change your position if you need to. Of course, you could face the mirror and look and see how your fingernail is doing. Are you keeping it in line with the A lever the whole time? Okay, let's go on and do D. know what's next C okay so you can check 
those different intervals to and from the A, and you're really policing your left index finger right now and trying to stay really controlled and really in line with the A lever. Now, we're going to go back and play the same excerpt we played from the all region audition music for this coming year. We're going to play that excerpt again. And your challenge here is that you are going to come to your A before the register change. You're going to come to that from open G. So it's like it's a trap. You could put your finger anywhere. OK, I moved my finger pretty fast, but if I, w I was too high and I just had a long ways to go. Hopefully you could see that on the screen here. I don't know. But if I put my finger too high, I'm going to have a really hard time getting down into place where I need to be. So t you have to try to get around that trap and make sure that your first, your first two notes from G to A, that you press that A really low. Maybe you even do this for a moment. You could play. So before I played the excerpt, I just added a couple E to A's to really try to check in with my finger and remind it what it needed to do, and then I just went on and played on up. Let's do it one more time without any extra business beforehand. We're going to start right on the G. Here we go. And left index finger, resist the trap. So, what your left index finger does is so crucial to register changing. So we've got all of the stuff about the air, really making sure that it's delivered nice and consistently, even when we get dif different resistant feedback. We've got the stability of the embouchure we're promoting while we're playing. Again, resisting the little speed bumps that we might feel when we change registers. We've got our voicing of the tongue very high and forward, regardless of what's happening with resistance changes that happen with register changes. And then the business of the left index finger. Now, we're going to finish this video with the, a little bit from the high school, the senior high school work this year. Senior high has to play E major thirds. And we add in the little challenge here of the pattern. We have to go to G sharp. So this is something, when we go from E to G sharp, that can cause all kinds of problems. Incidentally, it appears on the junior high list, A major thirds is there as well. So this is going to apply because G sharp is in both of these keys. So we have to learn how to keep our left hand very stable along with the control in the left index finger. So one of the next things that we can do, we can do some little exercises um, where we practice going between A and G sharp and stabilizing the hand. So first we remind ourselves about cradling the G sharp key, right? We have that I quality of wrapping around the instrument and our left index finger, it looks like it angles down to that tone hole. We're in contact with the G sharp key as much as possible. And we're going to play the following exercise. We're going to play this E, A, G sharp, A back down again. And right there, you can try to feel how going from G sharp to A you actually can move very, very little because when you press the A key by itself, it automatically pushes up on the G sharp key. It pushes it up there. So when you go from G sharp to A, you can continue to lean on G sharp and just move the tiniest bit to get the A to move, to get the A lever to, to engage. So let's try this. So one of the next 
parts about this in stabilizing the hand. We've been checking in with the index finger. Now, can you stabilize your hand by touching your, uh, your low E key with your pinky, um, as I sometimes refer to it as the tall bunny key, because you've got like two bunny ears down there. Ignore my extra key there, I've got an extra key because the, the prestige model has that. But you've got these two tall keys down there, they're like little bunny ears and this one is the tall bunny key. Can you try to keep in contact while you are doing this same exercise? Let's try it again and see if you can keep touching the whole time with your pinky key. Sometimes it's harder than it seems, doesn't it? Um, your hand might want to fly up quite a bit, and this is a little thing you can do to try to stabilize your hand. When I'm playing anything, really, at this point in my life, I'm trying to keep my pinkies in contact with pinky keys as much as possible. Of course, I can't do that all the time, but I find that it's a, it's a stabilizing factor for my hands and fingers to stay really close to home as much as possible, okay? Now, the final part of this is we'll play the beginning of the E major third. So we're not even going to play, um, I don't even know if we're gonna play a whole octave here, really. We're just going to work on the register change and how getting through G sharp is the challenge now, okay? So it's written as 16th notes, but you know, we could play it as eighth notes about here, right, ready? Um, hmm. Yeah, I'm going to just end it on a B right there. Okay, let's do that again. Two and three. And... I wasn't really ready for my C sharp that time. I sort of got there. Um, so you're finding the control in your left hand and how important that is. And if your fingernail starts going that way, if you move too high to get to the A key, you could see the problems that you are likely to have trying to play this scale in thirds right there. So that's one reason that we have these exercises in the all region audition music, because we're trying, of course, we need to be able to separate students one from another to have their appropriate chairs within the organ within the bands, but also it's really to teach you the fundamentals you need. So that's why we have these scales in thirds in place. So happy practicing. I hope some of this has helped and feel free to get in touch with me if you have any questions that I can try to help with. And there will be a part two video which will specifically address the altissimo register and how it applies to the E major thirds for the senior high school all region audition music for this year in Arkansas.